Hello everyone, my name is Eric Chuma for Financial Inside Zambia and welcome to the property series. Joining me right now is Helen Chileshe who serves as associate at Mayan Company. Helen, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. How are you, Cedric? I'm good. I'm good. Glad to have you here. Thank you for having me. So are you able to tell us what's the first step in a conveyancing transaction and maybe even explain what a conveyancing transaction is? Okay, thank you. So a uh, conveyance really is the transfer of property and in this case land. So from one, it could be a person or an entity. So from a person to an entity and uh, vice versa. So that really is what um, conveyancing is. And I would like to believe that the first step in any conveyance is actually obtaining instructions from your client because you have to know what you're doing, especially well, basically, you are ascertaining if you act for the vendor or the purchaser and what instructions are falling there from. Yes. So what is the initial document prepared after instructions are gotten from the client? So once you obtain instructions from the client, the document that is prepared in this case is a contract of sale. So a contract of sale sets out the agreement between the parties as regards the transfer of the property the contract of sale is prepared by the vendor's advocates. So this is the person selling the property. And the contracts of sale in Zambia are um, guided by the Law Association of Zambia General Conditions of Sale from 2018. So as a practice in preparing this documentation, and are people generally restricted to the Law Association General Conditions of Sale? So really, a contract is you know, an agreement between the parties and so parties are at liberty to vary the general conditions of sale that were promulgated by the Law Association of Zambia. So you could agree and say um, risk will pass at this point as opposed to this point, depending on what's provided in the general conditions. So uh, I also asked, are they limited to the general conditions? For example, can they go outside of that? Uh, when creating a process, uh, contract, of, contract sale. of sale. So yes, you can go outside of the conditions provided in the Law Association, Law Association of Zambia general conditions. So when you vary the terms in the Law Association of Zambia conditions, those are known as special conditions and they will be listed in the contract of sale. You, it will be indicated special conditions and you have them listed one, this and this and this and this. Okay, and what are some of the other requirements for a conveyance transaction aside from that contract of sale? So in order for you to actually transfer a property, you need to have state consent. So property in Zambia is vested in the president. So once you, for as a, so as a vendor, you would have, you'd be holding property um, as demised from the president. And so in order for you to transfer that property to a third person, you would require consent of the president consent of the president to transfer that property. So you'd be applying through the Ministry of Lands for consent to assign. Another thing you would have to do is ensure that you have paid ground rent because uh, in certain instances um, you will not be allowed to proceed with a transfer if there is outstanding ground rent on a property. And are there any other critical steps when it comes to actually uh, completing a conveyance transaction? Okay, so another thing that I would say is critical is um, depending on the nature of a transaction. So, for example, if it is a sale and it is not um, a sale such as under like a deed of assent, we are transferring to immediate family. If you are selling to a third person, you would have to pay property transfer tax to the Zambia Revenue Authority. So what different deeds are used when transferring property? Okay, so there's quite a bit there. So you have... Initially, you have a deed of assent. This is where property is being transferred from the estate of a deceased person to their beneficiary. You have a deed of moiety. This is where, say, a husband holds property as an individual and decides, look, I want to hold this property with, say, my wife and my children. That's a moiety. You have well, a deed of assignment, which is the one technically where if you're assigning or basically selling your property off to another individual, you have a deed of surrender when you are basically giving the land back to the state. Hmm. You've mentioned that uh, some deeds are needed when multiple people are owning a piece of land. Mm -hmm. So 
can people or multiple people own a particular piece of land is it joint tenancy or tenancy in common are you able to explain that okay yes so you can actually hold property with um, another person so joint tenancy is a situation where you hold property with an I- with another person in an indivisible share and so it operates in such a way that say for example you and I hold property together right and uh, a joint tenancy if i die my share of the property immediately goes to you that's a right of survivorship so nobody can come and claim and say oh helen's interest in this property if we own under joint tenancy because on my death it devolves to you on the other hand tenancy in common is um divisible and my beneficiaries can inherit on my death hmm. so what what are there any deeds that differentiate the two like for example you mentioned the deed of moiety and the other deed as well are there any separate deeds or can one deed be used interchangeably for both so initially here since you're holding with another individual it could uh, you'd most likely be using a moiety a moiety yes okay and how is land inherited okay so when it comes to la- inheritance of land so we also go into the realm of um probate and succession So there we're looking at a situation of whether a person has died in testate meaning they've died without leaving a will or they've died testate. So if you own property and you die without leaving a will, firstly the person will have to apply for letters of administration to the court, to the High Court of Zambia. Then once uh, this is done, you would then register the letters of administration at the Ministry of Lands. then from there as the administrator that's when you would proceed to deal with the property of the deceased the same thing happens even where you leave a will your executor would have to first uh, approach the court get letters of probate and after that is granted you register them at the ministry of lands because you must show the ministry of lands that essentially look i invested i have invested with the power by the court or by the individual before their death and subsequently the court to deal with their land or their assets after their death can a firm inherit property so as it is when firms are holding land they don't hold it as a firm so it would be say for example myself yourself trading as a firm so it would be that the land is held by us individually as persons not the firm per se okay and this fancy word world is here most Zambians pronounce as caveat <laughs> you know uh, okay so i would tell us simply what is a caveat why is it enforced what conditions necessitate mm-hmm. a caveat being put on particular property or land okay so uh, a caveat basically is a notice or registration of an interest with the ministry of land so you would have a piece of land say owned by person a and then you would be saying look i have an interest in this land so in the lands and deeds registry act you have them saying um an intended purchaser or your mortgage so you'd be saying look i'm intending to purchase this property but while we are going through the whole process of um preparing the contract of sale executing the deed of assignment and all that stuff i do not want this person to deal with another third party in the background and so i'm placing a caveat to stop any other persons from dealing with the land such that in the event that you have person C coming on board immediately when they are deducing title which is trying to verify ownership of property they will see that there's a caveat on this land and they'll say hey B you're trying to sell me this land but there's a caveat placed by person A and also can non Zambians own land yes so how do they go about owning land so when it comes to um Z- non Zambians owning land we have section 3 of the lands act which provides well instances under which um non Zambians can own land one of them is uh, persons who hold um development license from the Zambia development agency yes should they own the land with a Zambian as well or can they own it wholly so in this particular instance it is that you know they can hold the property because they have the license there is no strict requirement usually the law provides that um so usually the law provides that you can hold land there is no requirement that it must be wholly owned by zambians but there must be 
at least 75% ownership by a Zambian. Okay, and let's say someone wants to know more or maybe needs legal services for their particular land or property, how can they reach out to May & Company? Okay, so May & Company is quite an innovative firm. We have presence on Facebook, we have presence on LinkedIn, we also have our website, www.mayandco.co.law. Up there, you will meet our Maybot, who is quite interactive. Just chat me up and say, hey, May, and you have a particular question, and it will refer you to a particular individual and say, look, in this particular field, the person I can refer you to is, say, Mark Chomba. Oh, that's very, very innovative. <laughs> Thank you so much, Helen, for your time. It's been a pleasure having you. Thank you for having me. Right now, I am joined by the president of the Zambia Institute of Architects, Mr. Fidelis Kawili. Mr. Kawili, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for inviting the Zambia Institute of Architects to be a guest at your show. It's our pleasure. So, are you able to tell us what role exactly does do architects uh, play in the construction process? And maybe tell us a bit about the history of architecture in Zambia as well. All right. I'll start with the history. So, uh, architecture or the profession of architecture is not new in Zambia. Uh, you might want to know that uh, the profession was there even before independence. Uh, it was founded in 1954, and then it was called the Northern Rhodesian, Rhodesia Institute of uh, Architects. But not only until 1995 or did it become an act, meaning that for you to practice an uh, architecture in Zambia, you have to be registered uh, under the Zambia Institute of uh, uh, an Architect. And anyone doing so and not registered is actually breaking the law. Yeah. So what is the importance of involving an architect in your construction process? And what are some of the negative effects of neglecting an architect as part of that process? All right. So uh, it's very important that the moment you get a thought of wanting to get into the architectural space, that is wanting to design. And if you can allow me, let me use uh, uh, a house as an example. If you're thinking, I want to build a house, before you go anywhere, engage an architect. That architect will guide you in the processes you have to take to actualize your dream. So the architect will also look at how much money against, how much money you have against your dream, right? Is this money feasible for you to actualize? And, or is that money, can we change your dream a little to try and accommodate your ideas into this uh, budget. Uh, also, they'll guide you on where you're going to build. We've had people building in the wrong spaces because they were not aware. They were just bought land from somebody, uh, half the time even illegal people selling land, and they build there. Then before you know it, the local authorities come to demolish. Why? Because there was no involvement of a professional to guide from beginning. Had they been a professional to guide, they would have said no. Uh, for you to build here first, you need to get t a title deed, right? If it's state land, it's a different story if it's traditional land. And with uh, that title that you have, what are the perimeters of, of your land, right? Uh, where we want to build within the perimeters or is this the right location for where you want to build? Is the soil of where you want to build able to carry your building, right? Before you even start, an architect will be able to know because we are experts in that field. And guiding through the, the design stages until the end will also advise you to say, now we need to submit this uh, uh, drawing to the local authorities for approval before you start building. And all that, you're avoiding uh, people coming to harass you because you are building illegally and with that. So uh, a, a professional architect will provide guidance and will hold your hand as you plan and develop your property. Yeah. Okay, and some architects have actually focused on residential homes. Are you able to tell us <coughs> what does the landscape look like for residential homes? All right. So, <coughs> excuse me. We, you, we seem to have everything changing to residential now. We have all the planned uh, farms that are now being subdivided. 
uh, being turned to, 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 to residential, the commercial spaces are all being cut down to small little lots. And that's where the appetite is because a lot of people want to invest in, in, in housing because of the deficit that we have in, in, in housing. But even as we do that, we have noticed that a lot of people are not involving architects as they develop. And as such, we seem to be having confusion in the built environment because everybody is just building the way they feel it should be done or the advice that they are getting from the builder, the way most people are running to instead of engaging professionals. And this has messed up our communities and our cities in Zambia, even our uh, rural areas, right? But if you compare with uh, the rural areas that we have uh, with our neighbors, maybe in uh, Botswana and the cities, or you compare with uh, the cities in South Africa, you compare with even, even Zimbabwe or Namibia, there's a huge difference. Zambia is... There seems to be confusion happening in the way we are planning, right? Because we are not putting professionals ahead. And the government, the local authorities, us as a people are supposed to advocate for the use of architects if, our, if we want uh, our cities to look better and to look more, more organized. Uh, you have mentioned built environment, and we are just coming out of the cholera crisis. And what was seen with cholera was that there were some hotspot areas that, for lack of a better term, are not well designed, and thus led to the proliferation of the disease. Are you able to tell us the role of architects in creating uh, good environments for dwelling as well as for residential and just generous part of the entire town planning process or district planning process as well? This is uh, 2024, and we are still talking about Corilla. Very unfortunate when we have experts in the country. Uh, you might want to know that we've had Corilla in Zambia since 1970, and almost every year we face the same problem. And Corilla is mostly because of poor sanitation, right, and people not having access to clean water. I won't speak about clean water, I'll talk about sanitation, uh, because this speaks to infrastructure, and this speaks to what we do as architects. These are things that we can control. If we want to end Corella in Zambia today, we can do that by engaging the right people to plan the way things are supposed to be. And once we learn that we need to use the right people to work on the right things, I think we won't be having these problems that we have. So most of these uh, outbreaks are happening in unplanned settlement. What leads to unplanned settlement, right? And how do these unplanned settlements start? They'll probably start with one, two, three, four, five people. Before you know it, it's thousands of people staying in that neighborhood. Where are we when that is happening, right? And if we realize that we still want to the people to live in that area, why don't we go there to help them plan as they are planning, right? Or why don't we plan a separate area and relocate those people to those, uh, of course, with uh, proper guidelines followed, to those areas? And most of them are sitting on prime space, right? Which could be utilized for other things and that money used to invest in other things that could help the, the nation. And also, it's not too late. We can still go back to those unplanned settlements, right? With, uh, of course, working with the other professionals in the built environment. We have the, 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 the planners, the regional planners. We have the surveyors. Uh, we have the, the, the engineers. We have the quantity surveyors as well for cost control. And, of course, with uh, architects being project managers that we are trained to be, and even in helping in the designs of the, the properties that will be there and replan those settlements, right? Of course, some properties might have to be sacrificed uh, to ensure that we have proper access to, to those facilities. Then the local government and the government can come in to provide this either proper designed water kiosk, proper uh, uh, design for bringing water and proper sewer, and Corella will be normal. So the solutions for that are already there. It's just implementation that is needed. 
So is there any particular trend you've identified with regards to residential construction and in particular the design part of residential construction? Because we've seen a lot of that is what most architects seems to be selling online as well. And is there any dominant school of thought? Because we have seen uh, in our country, we're able to see a building that was designed, for example, post-independence, pre-independence, as well as maybe in more recent times, there's a difference that you can see just from looking at the design. So what trends are there and what is the predominant school of thought? Uh, the modern type of architecture in Zambia, right? And I won't say influenced by the Zambian architect, but influenced by our communities is we seem to all be inclined to brick and mortar, right? So predominantly, most of the structures that you see in the urban areas have been built using brick and mortar. One is because of the accessibility of, of the material that we have because we are limited to the type of materials that we have on the, on the market. And two, it's uh, believed that that is when I use this, right, with my hand aid money, this will be a structure that is going to last forever, forgetting that there are other alternative ways we could use uh, for construction. But if we go to the rural setup, we, we still find the communities in the rural space, uh, spaces still using thatch, still using clay in terms of the way the, the construction is done. And uh, shockingly, world over, people are now going in to use these um, materials, like the materials being used in rural areas, to to do the construction because these are the materials that will keep our earth green and reduce on carbon emissions. So, the thought is, I think as a nation, we need to put a bit of some resources in research. How can we improve on the traditional ways, and by traditional I mean the traditional architecture of the brisole, the socolotos, the, the clay, the thatch, and all the materials that are used, the gampos, the bamboo, right? Yeah. To do these mega projects that we want to do in, in Zambia. But if you talk of the, 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 the school of architecture uh, based on the architect, right? We are trained to build castles in the air, and that's what we do for a living. So the only thing that will limit us in terms of creativity is your budget. And we have, uh, under the Zambia Institute of Architects, we have we boast of architects trained throughout the world, right? Uh, mostly Zambia, but uh, the rest, a lot of people have been trained outside the country who come with a different feel of the practice of architecture. So depending on the architect that you are working with, you probably get uh, a, a good product uh, that will speak to what you want. Yeah. And also Zambia was recorded as having a one and a half million housing deficit. Now, what role are architects playing or can, uh, what role can architects play in addressing this gap in the market? So the 1.5 million deficit is actually uh, uh, going to be doubled according to uh, research and uh, credited documents that are out there uh, in the next eight years to almost uh, double what it is now. But the question that begs to be answered, Cedric, uh, is where are those people staying now, the 1.5? Right. If we have that deficit, uh, I'm not sure they are not. I'm, I'm sure they are not sleeping outside. So that person has a roof over their head, or those families have roofs over their head, right? But there might not be the ideal setup of the house. But that's what those families and those communities can afford. So we need to put in a little bit more money in researching and improving on those uh, structures that those people are living in because they're already living in in, 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 in in those buildings, right? How best can we make them more habitable and more structurally sound to ensure that uh, in the next eight years we don't double the number but we reduce it by half? Yeah. Okay. Also, the construction process is one that is known to be 
one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse emissions as well. Now, as architects, you are part of this process. And I want to know what role do architects play or can architects play in improving the quality of structures that are constructed, that are built, as well as promoting greener and cleaner, uh, more environmentally friendly designs. Thank you. So we we need to speak to to standards in Zambia, right? Do we have standards that speak to where the world is going, right? The world is going green, but do we have those standards that when we look at every citizen in the nation will know that I'm guided by these standards and I'm supposed to do A, B, C, D. I'm happy that we now have a Ministry of uh, Green Economy and I'm also happy to say that we paid a courtesy visit just to speak on how the Institute, the Zambia of Architects can work with the Ministry of Green Economy to see that we have more green spaces and we have more green buildings uh, popping up. Uh, more exciting, the, 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 we understand that the building that the Ministry of Green Economy is, is a green building. Uh, I'm not sure what ratings it has because we don't have local ratings for green buildings in Zambia. And that is something that we are working towards so that we should start having accredited Zambian green buildings. So government should lead by example. All government buildings should be turned into green buildings. And that's a starting point. And if you look at the infrastructure space, government should have the most buildings, especially commercial buildings in the country. So if government does that, that is a win by itself. And if the local authorities also have guidelines to ensure that every project that is being done in Zambia is following green standards, I think we'll be speaking of something different now. And that shouldn't end there. We need the Zambia Bureau of Standards to be more proactive and ensure that all the materials, because we are importing most of the construction materials in Zambia, all the construction materials that are coming in in Zambia are, are, are environmentally friendly materials that we are using. The local authorities should bring back our parks. When was the last time you sat in a park? Right? You probably, if, if you think of a park, you probably want to go to Mundawanga. That's probably the nearest botanical garden. But that is something that every neighborhood should have, where you have green spaces deliberately left to ensure that the, 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 the earth is protected and the Zambia is, is kept green. Even these road designs that we are having, do we have provision for green spaces where you have a provision where you have to plant trees? Of course, trees that won't damage the roads. There are trees out there that are supposed to be planted alongside the, 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 the walkways uh, that, that we have. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that. Thank you. Uh, is there any way someone can contact the Institute? Uh, do you have any online platforms? Yes, we, we have uh, a website, uh, www.zia.org. Uh, we have a very active uh, Facebook page. Also, if you want to catch us on, 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 on Facebook, I think everybody else is, is familiar with, uh, with Facebook. Yeah. All right. Thank, thank you so you. much. Right. This has been Saru Chuma for Financial Insights Zambia. Get to know.